Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am here with Anthony Rattuno for our part three of our Beatles Get Back discussion. If you're new to meeting Anthony, why don't you give a little quick background on your podcasts and uh, I guess how we maybe how we know each other? Yes. So, Glass Onion on John Lennon is my main podcast. Uh, deep dive into John Lennon. Uh, you and I, well, we have a mutual acquaintance, James Corbett. Yeah. Been following your show, of course, uh, for as long as it's been going, um, and uh, have a couple of other podcasts. Film Gold about films and life and life only, kind of about psychology and alternative media. I suppose, yeah. So I've been essentially studying John Lennon for the last three years, I guess. But I would argue that my entire Beatles fandom, which is more than thirty years, is, was was just preparation for the podcast. I didn't okay. realize it, but twenty-seven mm -hmm. years of research. And then, <laughs> so I've had the podcast going about three years and, you know, the plot thickens and it's, I'm absolutely amazed. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying I'm absolutely amazed that I've managed to do 85 episodes, wow. including the bonus ones. Uh, and some of them are up to two hours. So it's, uh, if you've never heard of my show, Glass Onion on John Lennon in all the usual places. And, uh, you know, it's a good, well, coming out for 200 hours now on, on one person who hasn't been around for over 40 years, sadly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've just planned out the last year and it's, it's kind of magical, really. You just, it seems like I'm just never going to run out of topics. And I do do general Beatles shows. I kind of broaden it out. And sometimes I'll look at John Lennon in a particular year. And in fact, the next one coming up, funnily enough, is 1969, would you believe? Oh. And then I'd look at the, the year 1969 outside of the John Lennon stuff and then sort of incorporate him into it. So okay. that's the way I've managed to broaden it out. But yeah, it's a... Pretty, yeah, pretty I, I serious love, deep dive. Yeah, I love your podcast. You you bring on some really great guests too, and you really have some great conversations. So people on on my that follow my channel, I think would really enjoy your podcast. Yeah, I feel like we're doing something similar, aren't we? We're, yeah, but like you said, I mean, there's mm -hmm. always something new to talk about that we haven't talked about or diving deep on some other issue. It's it's yeah. the Beatles are endlessly fascinating. So that's one of the things I always say, and. and Maybe there'll be a time when I get sick of t talking about them, but uh, I don't I'm, think that they will come. <laughs> so long you can as move on. Listen to me. Just move on to the Ruttles. You'll be <laughs> well, let's yeah. let's move into Get Back because we've been talking a little bit about Get Back. And one of the things mm -hmm. that I wanted to talk about is a question I'm going to pose this way. Can we safely now say that Paul is not dead? <laughs> Yeah, you know, every time I go on a show, <laughs> not every time, a lot of times when I go on shows, people will say, can I ask you about Paul is dead? <laughs> um, yes, I mean, uh, I, I said this ages ago, and when I listened to the Nagra Reels, it kind of, the idea that they could have coached him to, to, to tell all those stories, you know, that, as you said, you said earlier, they're referring back constantly to Liverpool and their boyhood. The idea that, that he could have learned all that seems very strange. And then that, that bit that I was saying in uh, part two, wasn't it? Uh, that close-up when he's about to tear up. I can say I could just see Hamburg Paul just with a beard, you know, the same eyes. And there's all kinds of other... Hunter Davis brought out a book about the Beatles lyrics a couple of years ago, and his handwriting is exactly the same before and after 66. Yeah. And there's a great bit, actually, where... Do you remember when George strikes up every little thing, which is... Yeah. I love that moment anyway. And he says, oh, yeah, we had that good one. When I'm walking, this, and Paul immediately starts harmonizing. Exactly. Beside her. So, yes, I would say that. But I, I was, I'm always trying to think of something original that I could say about Paul is dead. And let me, let me hit you with this. Sure. You know how, um, I don't know, humans are, humans are basically survived by adapting. And when, let's take, for example, when the Edward Snowden stuff came out in 2013. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you know, again, you can believe that or not, but we're, there's this new reality where we, where we kind of suspect that the government could start reading all our emails if mm -hmm. we became too much of a dissident. It's amazing how quickly people get used to new situations and the new cycle moves on. Mm -hmm. So let me posit. This is my. Uh, this is my. Let me posit this thought. If Paul admitted and said, "Oh, I'm actually William Campbell or William Billy Shears or whatever." I reckon within a couple of months, the public would, would just accept it and life would probably go on. You know, I think maybe Jane Asher, well, she doesn't talk about Paul, but 
you know, <laughs> she might have had something to do with it. Oh, suddenly I've got this new boyfriend I'm supposed to, you yeah. know, I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit silly, but well, let, let me say that, that I, th I think the public would get used to it and we'd get used to the reality. Oh, that's not actually Paul McCartney. That's the scary thing for me. <laughs> well, I, I don't disagree with that. However, <laughs> that's making an awful big leap for me personally. I, mm. Uh, the ever, I mean, I've always felt like the Niagara reels showed to me that there's no way, like you said, nobody could be coached, but I'll go even further and say, mm. how could somebody that wasn't Paul McCartney start bringing up a song that was written by him and John in the fifties that was never talked yeah, about. Exactly, yeah. It's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is proof for me. Um, the, the way they just the way these guys communicate with one another is constant hearkening back to their earlier days mm. and um it, it's just it's funny I and mean, they, they crack each other up by doing so mm. and um I, I just think it's just the way they communicate and that was one of the wonderful treats of get back for many of us diehard fans mm. like one of the other things that this was at the beatles were sitting in apple uh, I think maybe just before the rooftop concert, maybe it was just after, it must have been just before, because they're talking mm -hmm. about the, the show at Litherton Town Hall. And Paul's yeah, one yeah. telling, he said, hey, you remember how that first night, oh, we really didn't do well. And mm -hmm. we, were, we were tight and we were, and then the next night, well, we got a little bit better, but the third night, oh, we were just great. There's, and everybody's like in agreement with him. You know, I mean, they're, they're living, the, reliving the moment with him. Yeah, They're reliving the moment with him. And you can only do that if it's the same person. So yeah. I think I, I'm, I'm going to be anxious to hear the Paul's dead freaks respond to this. They've been rather quiet. Oh, and, yeah. and, and um, you know, because I mean, he just, and they, they just muddy the waters hmm. so that they may appear deep. And I'm just, I've been tired about it starting, oh, good, good Lord, since I started studying the Beatles in 81. And, um, you know, it just hasn't gone away. And people, I, some people, I think, do it just because just to be wise asses. Some people really believe it. Some people have to believe the worst. They have, they're just negative people. This can't be, this can't be so. What I'm seeing can't be so. And that's just a personality trait. I'm not going to try to talk them out of it, but I'm not going to converse with them on the topic for very long. But anyway, I think yeah. this, this, the bigger point and the reason I wanted to talk about this, I think that the get back film by Jackson, and if we do get any kind of additional footage, it will be a plus will be talked about as long as we're going to talk about the Beatles, because it shows not just their working relationship, but their way, the way they collaborate. And, and we, I think there's one thing we know is that the collaboration that we saw in 1969 in January is a product of them knowing each other for so long, starting in the 1950s. Yeah, a couple of things on that. Just to just to clarify, what I said earlier about the public adapting to it, I, I wasn't I wasn't saying the idea that it could be true. I'm saying mm -hmm. that in some parallel universe, let's say where they did pull it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What scares me is that is that we'd probably get used to it pretty quickly mm -hmm. because the news would move on. That was all. That was all I was saying. Yeah. No, I I get you. And the other thing I want to say, yeah, yeah, January 69, I've said this a few times, it's almost like the first Beatles anthology, isn't it? Because essentially what they're doing, they're sit, the four of them in this case are sitting around talking about the old days and having a bit of a jam. And, and that's mm -hmm. essentially what Paul, George and Ringo are doing in George's garden and in George's house in those bits of the anthology. So they, they started the anthology because one thing I've always found amazing, you know, we, I said we mentioned earlier and everyone's mentioned the journey they took when they when they're doing three cool cats let's say for example oh yeah that's exactly seven years since the decor audition but you know they must be thinking jesus that's like 400 years you know that's not seven years <laughs> yeah you know the distance yeah but it's very interesting this sort of getting back you know and, and obviously the get back song hadn't even started when when they arrived on january the second Oh, Matt, you didn't mention to the viewers what date we're recording this on. Yes, yeah, so the day just that, throw that in. Yes, thank you. The day that we are sitting here <laughs> having this conversation is January the 2nd. So Serendipity. Very, very important date in uh, Beatles lore with regard to the Get Back Let It Be sessions. Yeah, my, my Japanese and the girlfriend's... And the sessions. My Japanese girlfriend's over there, but she's going to keep very quiet. She's, <laughs> she's not going to interject. Anyway, just kidding. My hot blonde girlfriend is right over there. All right, right, okay. 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so yeah. So I've I've never been a proponent of Paul is dead. Of Paul is dead. Excuse me. Oh, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the Nagel reels are kind of bore that out. But as you said, you know, they, they kind of slip effortlessly into the Liverpool thing, don't they? It's it's yes, it's amazing. And I guess uh, I'll, I'll add another wide view of what Jackson's film has done here. Is it has given us, I guess, in this case with the Paul's dead issue, more truth. And I, I've been using the term accuracy. I, I keep using. The, I'm careful not to use the word truth because that's a kind of a tricky thing to capture in a bottle. But whereas the Paul is dead thing is concerned, this obviously, I guess it's, you call it evidence, call it what you will. But it, I think the point I'm making is that this documentary will continue to do that in, in maybe small ways and bits and pieces. And it just needs to be assembled properly. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. 15 years from now, I'm not sure what the view of this will be because by then the, the Let It Be movie will have been re-released in an upgraded form, we, we hope. Uh, and I think what's going to happen is if these Nagra reels continue, if any of this, not the Nagra reels, but the film gets out at all, people are going to assemble their own edits. I think it'll be up to the fans to do. And the fans, are, I think there's some fans that will do just a great job. Yeah, well, we live in this era, don't we? We're, we're mm -hmm. anyone, you know, an amateur. I don't mean that negatively, just so mm -hmm. somebody who's not doing that, it's not their job, can do that, can do great mixes of Beatles songs. Now we've got the stems and, you know, there's a person that um, has cleaned up the Star Club tapes. Oh, really? Far, far more than, oh. I don't know if it's still online. Someone sent me it, one of my oh, listeners no. sent me it about a year ago. There is all kinds of great. Club. There's also that could be re released. You could have, I mean, they've never released the deck auditions formally. Why not? That could, that's its own album. Why wouldn't you release that? I mean, I've heard it's not, it's not like it's unreleasable. I mean, we just listen to all this get back stuff. I mean, so there's all, there, there are other things to come out and be assembled. And it, it, this does seem to be a golden age of information where it's just easier maybe get at it like the other thing peter jackson talked about there are 40 hours of nagra tapes unaccounted for and he was yeah. able to maybe put a couple hours of it together from what he got from other sources so the 40 hours that i'm referring to was not seized when all these film cans were recovered in amsterdam in 2003 i might be wrong on that date so what happened to those did those get sold off prior or they, you know, that could, yeah. that could surface too. Yeah. That'd be fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, so we, we are in a golden age of, um, of a uh, Beatle mania in some ways, but I do believe that the window is going to be closing as we start to lose baby boomers, as your generation, my generation start to fall off because I think that it'll just be a narrower and narrower uh, group of fans yeah. And uh, it'll just be like maybe some jazz fans in the, in the future where it's just a narrow yeah. segment of people that dig the Beatles like you and I do now. It's just sort of a weird thing, actually. The Decor audition, there's a weird parallel, isn't it? Because that was the 1st of January. Yes. And they were apparently hung over because um, on New Year's Eve, people, obviously not at the moment, but people traditionally go to Trafalgar Square, which is you know, in the centre of London, and have a few drinks and celebrate the New Year. So it's funny that, you know, they're, they're kind of uh, thrust into an audition on the 1st of January that doesn't go brilliantly. And then Twickenham is almost exactly the same, 2nd of January, and it doesn't sound too great at the beginning. Right. For different reasons, but also because it is quite cold and it's early in the morning. So yeah. All goes yeah. around with the Beatles. Exactly. It does, it does go in a circle, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, interesting. Very good. Um, Yes, I also wanted to talk about, uh, there are some little moments in the, the Peter Jackson film that are almost standalone little vignettes that I could see that if we were to see these, these additional hours, you could assemble these little moments. But there are several special moments in, in Jackson's version. You wanna give us a couple of, the, of your favorites? Yeah, well, one that, one that we hadn't talked about before, I was really pleased about this. When, when the Nagra reels came, uh, when I heard the Nagger Reels a uh, year or so ago, uh, there's a really funny bit where George had walked out on the 10th 
and the next couple of days are pretty unproductive. It's just sort of trading one liners mostly. Mm -hmm. Michael Lindsay Og trying to get them to commit to something, anything, you know. And uh, you just hear on the nagger reels, you hear that in the background, a delivery guy turn up and say, uh, delivery for Mr. Harrison. And everyone just cracks up at the, the weird irony that George has walked out and the next day someone's delivering something. I don't think it was the eight track machine, but I was pleased that was in the show. It just, it just sort of appeared very quickly. You know? Yeah. And that's, that was a funny clip. That, that humor that they are always on with one another and yeah. all understanding the irony. Um, yes, yeah. I'm exactly. sure some people may have missed that, but that, that was great. Um, yeah. There are, there are moments I really like. There was, there was a moment that uh, somebody actually pointed out to me. They might've been in one of the trailers, actually. They're rehearsing, they're at, they're at Twickenham and they're talking about Let It Be. And John makes a suggestion of a, a different, uh, it wasn't a chord change, but it was a different note to end or start on. And they ended up going that route. So in that case, I, I saw, well, here's a, an instance where John Lennon is contributing to the formation of Let It Be which mm. primarily, unless you understand a little bit of music or see that, mm. most people are just going to write that off as, oh, it's just 100% Paul song. But I think that for me, a lot of the special moments were the collaboration. And that was one of them. There was yeah. another one where we had some very cleaned up vocals. There was some backing vocals on, I think it was Don't Let Me Down. Uh, it's escaping me now, but Paul and George, Put on some it's very a love beautiful that backing. lasts forever. Is it that bit? No, it's not that. No. It might have been on Dig a Pony. Boy, I can't remember. I should have. Mm. I forgot. Anyway. Okay. Uh, but the backing vocals that didn't wind up really in the, the, the recorded take that we know, which is great. You know, that's oh, why I enjoyed yeah. digging deep so much into um, All Things Must Pass. And here's another thing I forgot to mention. I was a little disappointed that all Things Must Pass got such a short shrift in Jackson's film. I mean, mm -hmm. we got 20 seconds. Now, was it? Yeah. is that, and I counted it, <clears throat> is that because Jackson didn't, I mean, is, is Jackson operating on the behalf of the Harrison estate? Well, let's keep this a Harrison asset and we'll, it's, you know, I, who knows? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, for my money, to, I mean, that's as much of a Beatles song as any song with 70 some takes, you know, I mean, they worked on it quite a lot and there's no. reasons it didn't get done, but there's a lot of songs that didn't get done. I think of all the songs, that's, that's the real shame because that was sounding great. Yeah, they had the three part really? harmonies, the Larry organ, it sounded good. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And there are a lot of special moments with them singing and harmonizing and little bits that aren't full takes that are, I've pieced some of that together. It's just brilliant mm. stuff. Mm. And that's one of the, gr the great missed opportunities of these sessions. It's not to get, you know, you know like I said, and uh, I said before, if Billy Preston was running a twig now, I bet that song gets recorded. Oh, yeah, instead, of, yeah. instead of sticking John on the Lowry organ or whatever. Oh, can you imagine put Billy? Band, put Billy on that, let Lennon play guitar, and he can concentrate Ooh. on the vocals. It didn't matter how high Lennon would have been. He could have, he, he wouldn't have at least play organ, organ and be high at the same time. Yeah. But, you know, what if? Yeah, another, another thing, um, this is another John thing. He loves uh, mocking other people's songs, but I think mostly in a nice way. You know, you hear him say, let it be, C, D, E, E, F, G. And there's a funny bit where he goes, Desmond had a sparrow in the something. <laughs> He's mocking Opla D. You know, that's, that's something that yeah. most, a lot of people comment on how George or John was like derogatory toward George because of um, mm. I mean mine. I don't read it that way. Lennon is sending everybody up all the time. He is, yeah. That's Give me, thing. What is McCartney's best song yesterday? Lennon gave him a hard time about that. This is how these guys are. And everybody all oh, see George, all oh, the people just, they're not reading shit. They're just remembering and parroting a narrative that's been spoon fed to them because that's mm. it's been said a thousand times and you get i get tired of hearing it mm. because it doesn't it doesn't seem to they, they're not taking lennon's way he communicates with them in in totality mm. he's always and you had said too some of the other little tidbits he's always making fun of people's names oh yeah and i had something to tell you about that yeah i wanted to tell you and, and the viewers uh, you know, he starts calling Glyn Johns Glynis. Yes. Um, and he calls Michael Lindsay Hogg Phyllis. 
I mean, do you have those names in the States? Because Glynis and Phyllis are basically old ladies' names. Yeah, do you Glynis, have those names? No. And, and Glynis right. Johns is a famous actress. Who's is an in, actress. Who's in uh, Mary Poppins. That's what I was going to tell you. I just discovered that was, recently. In fact. She's the yeah. daughter of famed actor Mervyn Johns, who's in the original uh, 1951 version of A Christmas Carol. But I digress. Ah, and he's also in a film we've reviewed called Dead of Night, which is a ah. great British horror film. Okay. Check that one out. Yeah, Mervyn Johns, yeah. So Glynis, ah, Johnson, very yeah, interesting. The term Glynis or Glynn, those are names that aren't, aren't American. Mm. And Phyllis, a little bit, yep. And uh, I, I missed how he called him Phyllis Lindsay Hogg. <laughs> Just once he calls him in the film, yeah. But I remembered that from Nagra as well. And I think, yeah, this there's clearly an edge to John Lennon because on, on that day, the 14th, the famous where he does the Canadian interview, um, there's a bit where he's kind of he's kind of a bit of a hard edge, and you can imagine he could be pretty nasty. I mean, we know that already, don't we? Mm -hmm. Probably with a you know, if he'd had a few more drinks, and he kind of he's he's one of these people that I've I've known people like this. I'm sure you have. When they drink, they kind of pick a victim, and they'll just get on that person mercilessly. And he doesn't really do that in on the Nagra or in this film, but you can imagine he might, you know. And his way, his way is to like make fun of people's names and give them women's names and things. Yes, I think you know? he had a way of cutting people down to size, and that was a way to maintain. That's not really a leadership quality, but it, it, it maintains his the hierarchy. I mean, he's sure. one of the four Beatles. He's one of the bosses anyway. But um, yeah, I think that's one of the things that he's just part of his personality. Like in getting back to George Harrison, I mean, there was no Beatle that was. Uh, everybody felt the wrath of his <laughs> not wrath but just were to the butt of his jokes yeah definitely and yeah. george with bringing an i mean mine i think john's response is hey you know we are a rock band here and what you yeah. brought in to translate george what you brought in as a waltz in my in mind you i am completely I, and i am making fun of you knowing full well that i myself brought a waltz to the beatles in the in the song uh, babies in black but we're not going to talk about that right now. I'm just going to make fun of your song because that's what I do. That's really what's I mean, going on. Well, I mean, Digger Pony is a waltz as well. So Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's making yeah. fun of it because it's a waltz. But Lennon's, he's brought waltzes to the Beatles and they recorded them. Yeah, this is the problem where, you know, eight hours. I'm, I was saying jokingly, part one, it wasn't enough. But what I meant was there's still some truth. Because you see John patting George on the head and going, oh, run along, little boy, or something. He says like that. It's not clear because it's quite a quick edit. And there are some quick edits, like when George mm -hmm. walks out. I won't, I won't go back to that now, but that's the pit of the film where there's some very, very quick edits. You're yes. thinking, uh, what exactly was going on there? But well, um, I, I, I took it when George walks out, that whole part leading up to that. I mean, there just wasn't video available to go along exactly. with the audio. I think he had to build something. Exactly. I mean, if there was more to show us, I, I, he would love to show it, but I just think there isn't anything. Definitely. So. And then, um, yeah, a couple of bits with Yoko. Just that, just this so simple, just Yoko and Linda having a chat and seeming like they're just having mm -hmm. a normal chat, like two relatively normal women talking about normal things. Yeah. You know? I like the point. My favorite <laughs> parts of Yoko in Get Back were there's times when you did see her kind of swaying and grooving to the music. Mm. typically was a john song and i also like seeing her write with the japanese writing on the wall where she oh, had yeah. a love sheet it would be nice to know what that was saying that's where you could have used some subtitles of what that was she was writing if yeah. it said anything at all but um it was cool to see her doing something other. and I, I actually like to see her knit i mean she's yeah, very funny, she's, like, she's being productive doing something all i mean that's that I thought that, that was cool. Well, she went on top of the pops knitting with a blindfold, didn't she? Oh, that's right. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the bit, um, oh, another favorite bit was when Heather, little Heather, starts imitating her. Yeah. And John says, Hey, Yoko. And then Yoko smiles, you know, rather mm -hmm. than going, Oh, stop making fun of me. You know, I think genuinely, and in fact, I had a guy on the show who, oh, God, I think he'd, I don't think he'd met John and Yoko directly. I, mean, I had a guy on it who lived with him for a couple of years, but it was someone else mm -hmm. that said they didn't actually take themselves that seriously. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they took the peace thing seriously. Yeah. But, you know, he said, yeah, we're, we're willing to be the world's clowns. But they didn't take themselves that seriously, in fact. On yeah. one level, maybe. But, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. I think that was their disclaimer mm. where 
hey, we're, 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 we're doing this with humor. Mm. And I think that's a good way to do it. And, but it kind of lets you off the hook of being at risk of being seen as too serious. That's it. Yeah. So good. You know, they probably did go through it. I mean, anyone who's artistic or creative, you probably don't, you go through phases where you probably take yourself quite seriously. You know, I've done it before because you think you, you take the work seriously. Sometimes by extension, you take yourself too seriously. And sometimes you don't realize you're doing it, you know? Well, but I, think, I, th yeah. I think I like those Yoko, just those human moments. I mean, the fact that she's reading the Beatles complete works. I mean, that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's normal. All these things on one level are very normal. Yeah. It's just a, it's a guy with a new girlfriend and he's given his girlfriend, oh, this, these are all the songs we've done, or it's a story of the Beatles. But it's just <laughs> weird because we know how crazy their life was. And, you know, I love, you know, I love those little moments. Unfortunately, we didn't see Alan Williams, did we? Because he's on the Nagra tapes. I remember that from last year. Yeah, I think he might be in one of the promos. I noticed that some of the it? emotional uh, trailers included footage that they didn't use in the final cut, uh, which was a nice little way to get a little extra stuff out there. Alan Williams, I believe, was one of them. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I remember him from the Nagra tapes. Um, what else was there? I uh, like, yeah, more of John's wordplay. You know, I've got a fever. And uh, mm -hmm. and he says everybody had a hard on. Yeah. You know, everybody. And then Paul says, except me and my monkey. Yeah. So, you know, they could give it back to him as well. It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think he respected that. Everyone will oh, yeah. say that, you know, he respected that. And the other one was, oh, old brown shoe. Yeah, just great to see George on the piano and saying, oh, Billy, what's this chord? And Billy goes, oh, it's diminished. And I just, I just love, because uh, I've, I've been a musician, mm -hmm. I love seeing musician, good musicians working together. I love that creative process. Well, what do you, I mean, obviously you're a Beatle fan. Mm -hmm. So you just use the term good musicians working together. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously the Beatles, I mean, the Beatles were not virtuoso players on any instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and most people accept that. I mean, I understand that the, some of the parts is greater than the whole. Mm -hmm. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. <laughs> but what, what, what was your takeaway just on the musicianship throughout? Because we have kind of some start points that are rocky and we end with the rooftop. I mean, John Lennon clearly is not really a lead guitarist. Um, what he did on Plastic Honor Band the year later, which is by far my favorite of his albums, it's pretty damn funky, you know. If you hear that, some of the guitar mm -hmm. on the album, but it's not it's not lead guitar in the traditional sense of solos and notes. Mm -hmm. It's more of a kind of rhythm slash lead guitar. Like a Keith Richards almost. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. So I, I think I think if you're talking technically, John is probably by far the weaker of the three. Obviously, Ringo's doing a different thing entirely, but of those three, um, he's a, I think Paul, but I think George on the roof, like we said, I mean, maybe he flowered quite late in the 60s, or maybe having two years off did him some good. He came back to electric guitar and thought, oh, this is fun. You know, I'd forgotten how much fun it was. But, you know, he's absolutely smoking by the end on the roof. Those yeah. licks are fantastic. Yeah. Um, he... uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think. You know, John Lennon, I had said in an earlier discussion about George Harrison possibly not giving his all into to the instrument, mm -hmm. moving over to sitar for a couple of years and being kind of mm -hmm. one foot in, one foot out, not being a leader, um, maybe being insecure about his playing, all those things. But, but then when you move over to John Lennon, I would say the same thing about Lennon. He did not work on his instrument. But mm -hmm. I nobody has talked about this. I'm going to talk to you about it. And you and I even, even talked about this. But okay. when... McCartney starts doing Get Back. We saw this song be born out of nothing. And then George and Ringo are sitting there. And then George starts adding some guitar. And so George is, is contributing. Mm -hmm. And then George leaves the band temporarily. And then when we come back, Lennon's playing lead guitar. Now, I like to talk about the lead guitar and Get Back because I find, and it's very lennon -y. He's very quirky with his playing. Mm -hmm. and I think he does a great job. And... Mm -hmm. It's not the best playing, but it's it fits the song perfectly. Like Ringo's drums fit the song, and he's playing mm. that the, the stuff on the rooftop, and it's cold, and he's doing those leads, mm. and that's lead. Those are lead lines throughout a good part of the song. It's not like you stop and do a solo in the middle. He's playing that through yeah. most of the song. Yeah. And I, what is your opinion on his, his playing, and then just 
his addition and contribution to that song. I mean, the Finnish when, thing. When, by the way, you've got a lead guitar standing right next to you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly why he got the lead. Again, there may not be some, there may not be a deep reason for that. They might have just thought, oh, he might have just said, oh, do you mind if I do the lead for this? I one think the reason is, is Lennon stepped up. Yeah. I think so. Because that seems to be what happened. That's what he had to do in the Beatles, yeah. I think John, if you take Get Back, what he actually ended up with is great. I mean, I mean, he's, he plays almost at the same solo three times. Mm -hmm. But, you know, who cares? It doesn't matter, you know. Mm -hmm. He's kind of where George was a few years early, because if you listen to like live at the BBC or some of those old 64, mm -hmm. when you hear George doing solos, it doesn't sound that great. Yeah. When he drifts away from uh, the solo he put on the record. So I, I think they all had maybe something in common is that they, they were very good at, or John and George, let's say, they're very good at finding a great lead line for the finished record. But again, to go back to the Solpi and his, Co-author's name, I forgot. Swigert. Thank you very much, Swigert, yes. <laughs> to go back to that book, again, they're conjecturing in the sense of, they say they play, oh, John, John plays an appalling solo. And that was probably true, because I don't think he could play solos. But I think Paul and George had really improved a lot. I mean, I think they're pretty pretty nifty by 69, those two, I'd say, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I think they all, I mean, you've talked about the the trading off of the solos on the song The End at Abbey Road. Yeah. yeah. And um, John's contributions are are rather simplistic, but they're the most guttural. I mean, they've got maybe the most depth to them as far as where it's coming from. But yeah, they, I mean, to me, those solos, the teamwork, it's about, the Beatles are about teamwork. So yeah. when I hear, I've got a feeling uh george's guitar i mean it's just so perfect within the structure of the song because i've just been listening to some of the deconstructed portions of that song and that's it's even more amazing to listen to yeah. george's guitar parts alone like whoa this guy was smoking yeah he was he was well there's a very good uh, youtube channel i'd like to plug which i have nothing to do with called abley house a b l y house okay. recommend it to all your viewers and thanks to my friend kester for recommending it to me it's a bunch of guys who recreate the instrumental versions of the Beatles songs. Oh. And it's all on video, so you can see the guitars and the bass. And they try and use exactly the same equipment. Mm. And, you know, the drummer will have, like, a tea towel over the, over the snare. So they meticulously, and they produce these note perfect. They do vocals on a few of them, but yeah. instrumentally, they just recreate it perfectly. And if you watch, for example, I saw her standing there. George's lead, just those little lines he comes up with, are just brilliant. Yeah. And it's not flashy, you know, it's probably, you could copy it fairly well, but it's not quite going to have that that thing they had, mm -hmm. you know, which is honed by all those, obviously, all those hours in Hamburg and all those hours playing together. So they, they I think they all had this, this this wonderful ability to, they were just great at making records, that's the other thing. Yeah. So... You know, you give John a spontaneous solo, it probably will sound appalling, especially if it's like 10 in the morning and he's had a, yeah. he's had a rough night, you know. <laughs> they, 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 they did it perfectly for the songs, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd say Paul is the closest to a virtuoso on the bass, I'd say. You know, he's pretty, some of his stuff's pretty complex, but it seemed like yeah. on Abbey Road, they all just massively raised mm -hmm. their game. And I think it was just to do with professional pride, you know. Let's I make think... a really good album. Yeah, I, I don't, I dislike the, the, oh, let's give it our best shot because this is going to be the end, or I, I don't like that explanation. It sounds, okay. it sounds a bit Hollywood to me. I really right. believe what you just said it came down to professional pride mm -hmm. because these guys certainly had it and they, they did make something out of Let It Be, as we've seen. And the pride did come in big at, big at the end on the rooftop and, and just taking ownership and just seeing it through. Yeah. Let me say one more thing, because um, it's a slightly, well, it's not off topic because it's about get back, but um, <laughs> let me just defend John Lennon for a second, because I hear these people, they're always going on about, oh, John had a dearth of material, so he went back to Across the Universe and well after 909. Now, you ask any songwriter, sometimes if you haven't, if you've written a good song that you know is good and you haven't recorded it, sometimes you want to kind of get it out of the way, not in a bad way, but you want to get it recorded. So p people always talk about, it's so simple to say, oh, you didn't have enough material. First of all, it just contributed to about half of a double album. 
Yes. You know that. And, you know, he, and one after nine and nine is perfect because it's the whole spirit of the thing. In, in one sense, that song typifies the, the whole spirit of the project, mm -hmm. yeah, along with obviously Get Back because it's a getting back. But um, So I wanted to defend him on that song. And across the universe, it never really fit. You know, I listened to the Let It Be album for the first time 30 odd years ago. And I always thought, oh, that one seems a bit like it's a bit psychedelic. It doesn't really mm -hmm. fit the album. Mm -hmm. So I reject that. And the other thing is that I've always thought Let It Be is a great album. I mean, yeah. two two of us get back, Let It Be, Long Awaiting Road. Don't Let Me Down wasn't on the original album, but it was produced at these sessions. Right. You know, and I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever talked about this, but I think sometimes we get our opinions from the Beatles, don't we? So John yeah. Lennon slags something off. And there's a natural tendency for everyone to think it's crap, you know. And I'm sure yeah. I've done this as well. I'm not saying I'm different. Yeah, I I have as well because if you you've only got that information, you mm. go with it. But mm. I've got when you start listening to it with your own ears and and knowing, hey, I can go against something Lennon says because what I exactly. got it makes more sense than what he says. And people don't want don't like doing that. They're just it's not their thing. Yeah. But it, re, re, with regard to John Lennon's material that he, that he had for the get back sessions you're right it, the, the white album he had slightly more material than paul so he was used a lot of his stuff up but let's the, the initial idea for let it be get back was to use songs from the white album so he i don't think he was he could have probably written a few more and he exactly. and then after half once they got back to apple he started bringing up some new stuff. They they went through more takes of uh, Child of Nature, yep. and he he was you know he was engaged. So I mean he could they started working on I want you see she's so heavy. Yeah. So yeah, he he didn't he came up with stuff pretty quick. Yeah, I just and, think it's a bit too. I mean, particularly for people who've never written any songs, it's a bit it's just a bit rich. You know, I mean they're not machines for God's sake. You know, well it's presumptuous. It's, to, yeah, I mean as if these Beatles could churn them out effortlessly forever now mm. you can churn stuff out but quantity doesn't equal quality i mean yeah. nobody's gonna mccartney 3 is not going to be remembered as the same way as abbey road or even let it be i mean for yeah. obvious reasons but um you know you 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 pass you've got your time and and um the beat that was their time and lennon whipped it into shape pretty quickly because this stuff on abbey road ain't bad either Come together yeah. is a pretty good song. I mean, you know, so the guy yeah. was, he just had, I mean, he had a lot of, he had a busy 69 with the bed in and the marriage and all this stuff going on. And um, when he got serious, he got serious. He could produce. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had an incredible 1969. Yeah. I actually had a book. I think it was written, I think it's called the John Lennon Encyclopedia. I don't have it anymore, but it's an A to Z. Mm -hmm. And the amount they packed into 69 is insane. Mm -hmm. and it's so strange because he, even though he's, he wasn't as lethargic as you know the popular opinion had said yeah. you know it was a little bit lethargic he wasn't you know, he did like the early mornings and everything but to go from that to to the year they had it was absolutely mad yeah and the magic of january 69 is like i said it, it is it's a snapshot but it's a month-long snapshot and it's absolutely fascinating and you have to think of all the things that happened to all these people afterwards obviously before as well yeah but it's very fascinating and, and like i said earlier it, it's really the first beatles anthology in a funny way yeah i never thought of that but you're, you're right yeah. they're doing it yeah. they're they're actually reminiscing on their seemingly very long career at the age of 27 28 and so, looking back on the early days and yeah yeah it's amazing but um yeah i, I say you know i think get back was amazing you know uh, it's got obviously got some flaws if you depends how many holes you want to pick in it you know but yeah. you know i i me as a super fan of 30 years or more you know i was i was very happy with it and i would you know we were talking about the rooftop earlier for example another idea for a dvd extra would just be a you know the, the whole concert just a frontal shot you know, like, like you'd have in like their concerts sure. in Australia where they just filmed it. And then maybe a couple of shots of the roof or Yoko or Maureen or whatever, but, mm -hmm. you know. But um, yeah, yeah, great stuff. <laughs> I've run out of things to say. <laughs> yeah, so let me 
close this up by just talking a little bit. I finally heard some stats from Disney, or actually it's the Nielsen ratings that talked about mm. uh, the viewership. And because uh, it, it ta- it's taken a month for this to come out, or more than a month. So the Beatles Get Back was ranked seventh in streaming that week. There were six other shows way ahead of them. And these were like just, you know, streaming shows that might have 12 episodes or however many there are. So in terms of where they wound up in that week, they were in the top 10, but they were seventh. And if you, in the way that Nielsen tracks streaming is minutes watched. So these other these other shows in a couple of cases almost duplicated what the Beatles minutes watch were. So I think um, it'll be interesting to see how the minutes watch go over this next months, if we can even get a hold of those inf- that information. And then if there is, you know, a DVD that comes out or in Blu-ray, how that sells, because that, you know, Beatle fans, your generation and the baby boomer generation were, I think, I guess we're more we're physical media people. You may be more likely to buy the DVD or Blu-ray. Certainly, we're more likely to buy vinyl. That's that's getting a little more popular in the younger generations, but I don't know that that's going to last. Mm. So I, I guess it was a it was not maybe the big hit from a rating standpoint that people were assuming it was going to be, be just because it's the Beatles. Mm. But seventh and every show that was mentioned ahead of the Beatles, I had never heard of it. So oh, I'm not the target for that. So that I don't you know I'm just not a. So I just uh, so I throw that out there for people to chew on for a bit. Do you know what the budget was and whether they recouped it? I do not. I'd love to know what the budget was because Jack's worked on it for four years. I wouldn't mind knowing his salary. He had one other editor. I don't. He, I, it was a smaller crew, I think. Yeah. In New Zealand, but you know, not. It seems to me that um, he probably got paid pretty well, but um, why not? I mean, he's probably from a lot of the rings. He probably had enough to. Retire. I think he put a lot. I think he put a lot of hours. In. Ten times. <laughs> he put, I mean, he he went above and beyond. I think, and it, it, I don't expect perfection out of anybody, um, so I don't hold the, the imperfections against him. But um, man, I, I think he went above and beyond. I think he overdelivered. That's the term I use. And I was very, and I was impressed by his appearances on podcasts. I mean, he gave those guys four hours and Robert very three gracious. hours. I think. Yeah, very gra- uh, yeah. I never, you know, I never detected any. I mean, obviously, everyone's got an ego. It's silly to say that someone's got no ego. It's ridiculous. But I didn't get any sense of like, uh, oh, you know, I'll give you this amount of time. Because that's, that's actually one of the reasons why I, I never really approach famous people to come on my podcast. Because yeah. I always feel like suddenly, you know, you're going to lose a bit of the freedom. Right? They might say, oh, I've got 45 minutes. Or they'll, they'll have a PR person say, oh, so-and-so will be available at 6 o'clock. And you've got 45 minutes and that. So, But he didn't seem like that, you know. So... Uh, Maybe not him, but maybe I'll contact some more high-profile people to come on Glass Onion. You Is know, that why you never had me on your podcast, Anthony? Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have been on. Technically, you have because I put a bonus. But uh, that's true. <laughs> no, I'll. Um, I've got this. Uh, I'll show you. In fact, I decided to plan out. I mean, look at this. This is ah craziness. So yeah, if you find a good topic, you can. You're more than welcome to come on this year. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's close it up there. I think that uh, let's leave them wanting more if it's possible with yes. the get back stuff. And um, again, why don't you tell, them, tell the audience here where you can be found? Yeah, Glass Onion on John Lennon. So I host it from SoundCloud, but you'll find it. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, Spotify, all the usual places. Um, um, maybe I'll give you the other. Twitter is at Onion Lennon, capital O, capital L. Uh, and then there's a Facebook group just with the same name, Glass Onion on John Lennon. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's got sort of psychology edge to it as well. You know, I studied it. I'm not a professional by any means, but I studied psychology. So I have that kind of edge to it. And um, as I said, uh, part one, I think it was, yeah, I'm writing a book based on the podcast, but it's not just going to be transcriptions. It's going to be a lot more. So that'll have a psychology edge. And I've had, had a therapist on last year, Alan Parry. And he didn't want to diagnose John Lennon, which I totally understand. First, because it's probably impossible, <laughs> but also because John Lennon's not around. But he did say he would help me out. Mm-hmm. Um, so there may be some psychological analysis, which your former guest Aaron suggested mm-hmm. would be a good idea for a Beatles book. So yeah, 
I uh, hope, hope to do that this year. It won't take as long as Mark Lewis. Good. Very we good. We love you, Mark. We're looking love forward you, to it. We're looking forward to part two. But yeah, very thank good. you very much for having me on. This has been absolutely fantastic. Oh, yeah, thanks for being on. Uh, I always have a great time talking to you. And everybody watching, I'll have plenty of the links to reach Anthony below. And until thank next time, much. I thank you for watching Pop Goes the 60s. Thank you.